And now, Deborah Cobalt Live. Hi, everybody, and thank you for joining us on Deborah Cobalt Live. Ah, there we go. Hi, everybody, and thank you for joining us today on Deborah Cobalt Live. And please welcome my guest calling from Notting Hill in London, uh, Jackie Lynch. Jackie is the author of this terrific book, The Happy Menopause. She also hosts a podcast by the same name, The Happy Menopause. Um, and Jackie, you're also a nutritional therapist, and you're joining us today because you're one of the best of the best to help us get started on our journey uh, into menopause, through menopause and beyond, right? So thank you so much for being here. Oh, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah. Um, my question to you is the word menopause. I was thinking about that when I was writing about uh, your book and all that. Who named it that men o pause because what i was saying was wait a minute does this mean that people are supposed to take a pause on men when they hit menopause because <laughs> that's not happening to me tell me no I, I don't think it's that i mean i'm I'm not a linguistic specialist but i'm fairly certain that meno comes from the greek um and so it's that pause um when women uh sort of the pause in menstruation essentially and that pause and that well, as far as, as the way I see it, actually, is it's a move on to a whole new way of life. I, I don't like to think of it as the end of something. I really do see it as a door opening with lots of new possibilities. Yeah, you don't have to That's carry around your right. pads anymore, right? So um, Exactly right. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about uh, your work as a nutritional therapist. Uh, what do you do? I guess primarily you work with uh, women, right, in the middle of their lives, correct? Yeah, that's right. I, I work in um, a nutritional clinic, essentially, where I'm working with women, mainly in their 40s, 50s, and perhaps early 60s, who are looking for a nutritional approach to manage their health, in particular, the symptoms around the perimenopause and the menopause, balancing their hormones. And because, of course, uh, with the drop in estrogen affecting pretty much every body cell, that can come in lots of different guises. It might be digestive issues, it might be headaches, fatigue, weight gain, and there are lots of different ways that the menopause can affect you. So although it's, um, it, it's one area that I cover, in terms of the symptoms and the way it affects women, it's very, very varied. Mm. Let's talk a little bit about, and I know that you cover this uh, in the book, um, about perimenopause. Can we talk about that? What is it? And when does it generally hit women? I know there's kind of a wide range with all this, right? But Ah, sure. Let's get a sort of a range on that. Okay, well, the perimenopause is basically when all the fun and games happens. I mean, the word menopause technically only applies to one day. It's the day when it's been 12 oh. months since your last period. We use oh. the term much more loosely to cover the whole period. Sorry, no pun intended. But um, actually, it's the perimenopause, the, the premenopausal years. And for most women, those hormonal changes are going on in the background from the early 40s onwards and typically the first hormone to start declining is progesterone and that's the one that can usually trigger the emotional and psychological symptoms like anxiety loss of confidence brain fog for example and many women get confused because their periods are still regular they're still thinking they're way too young for the menopause and so they can get very frightened and worried by these symptoms I've had women in my clinic saying, I thought I was going mad. I thought it was early onset Alzheimer's. And they were actually relieved to discover it was a hormone issue. So what do we do? You know, and I know you're big on, you know, I, I'll use the word treating, but um, caring for this stage of life um, with nutrition. Um, what do we do? Because it's, it's, I mean, I guess everybody knows to, you know, have dark green leafy vegetables, some broccoli and some lean meats, right? But it's easier said than done, right? So what would be sort of a, a sensible, but fairly easy enough approach to help us get through that? Sure. I mean, I think you can't underestimate the importance of nutrition because we are basically made of food. You know, it feeds every body cell, it supports us and heals us and nourishes us. So of course it makes total common sense that when it comes to hormone balance, your food can affect it for better or worse, depending on what you're eating. So the thing to be doing is really looking at a hormone balancing diet. 
And there are a few ways you can do that. Um, the first one probably would be to make sure you're eating more protein because mm -hmm. protein is the stuff of life. We are literally made of protein. And it's very, very important for women in midlife for lots of reasons. People often think of it in relation to muscle mass, and that's, that's really important because we can lose about 40% of our muscle mass by the time we've gone through the menopause. Wow. That's interesting because a lot of people will say, oh, but I weigh the same. It's like, well, guess what? Not really, because you lost some of that muscle mass and you probably replaced it with a little bit of fat. So you might weigh the yeah. same, but you don't quite look the same or feel the right. same probably, right? Mm, and you don't have the same strength. And muscles are really important because they also put pressure on our bones. And we need yeah. that pressure on our bones to build up the strength and the bone density. And again, probably many of your listeners are aware that one of the issues post-menopause is that lack of bone density due to the drop in estrogen, which can lead to the risk of fractures if you're falling over. Oh my gosh, this just sounds so rough, right? But as you said, we can look at it as a new sort of uh, journey into our life. I want to get back to the protein though, because like I, for one, um, am not a giant meat eater, not because I have anything necessarily against it, but I don't quite like it. So what are some other areas where we can get our proteins, um, okay. you know, other than just nuts? There's lots of areas, right? Sure. I mean, meat is not the only game in town when it comes to protein. You've got right. fish, eggs, concentrated forms of dairy, like Greek yogurt or cottage cheese, for example. Um, what else? Uh, lentils, chickpeas, beans, quinoa, nuts and seeds, lots of different forms of protein. And probably the biggest reason for focusing on protein that I haven't even touched on yet is that it helps to balance your blood sugar. And if really you're only doing one thing and you only remember one thing from all the things we're going to chat about today, remember this, get that blood sugar balance and your hormones will start to fall into place quite naturally. Hmm. So how do we do that? Is there a specific time of day that we should start working that uh, on that or from the moment we wake up, just have a more protein rich breakfast, for example? Yeah, I mean, basically, the sooner you start in the day, the better, because hmm. once you start on the blood sugar seesaw, once you start stuffing yourself with sugary foods, your blood sugar is going to spike, it's going to crash, and it will go on like that throughout the day. And it's really hard to get off it because your hormones have started determining your food choices and not your brain. And we all know that in a battle with the hormones, they will win. So the trick mm -hmm. is, is two nutrients, complex carbohydrate, which is rich in fiber. So brown stuff, brown bread, brown rice, brown pasta, for example, vegetables, terrific source of fiber. And then the protein, now protein is hard to digest. So it slows down the release of that complex carbohydrate, keeps the mm -hmm. blood sugar nice and steady, keeps you going for longer, fills you up more, activates the satiety response, which helps you know when you're full, really important for women who might be tending to binge eat and comfort eat during menopause. And of course, the issue of weight gain is something that affects many women at that time. So having protein really helps in so many ways. So in your book, when you talk about if there's only one thing you do, you must... Yeah, balance your blood sugar. Balance the blood sugar. Yeah. Um, I, I have a confession. May I? Sure. This morning I got up and did something I don't like to do, but my husband brought in some croissants because we have some um, family here and I stole one or two. Isn't that awful? And when I start my day like that, my blood sugar is spiking immediately, right? immediately. Absolutely. Right. So yeah. if you, to your point, right, if you start that way, you're sort of, you know, going uphill the rest of the day, mm -hmm. I have to say. So you're right about that. Um, that's okay. I cheated. I'm going to be good the rest of the day. But to your point, to control the blood sugar, because it also controls, right, mood swings. Um, you know, now here's a good one. How do you really know that you're in perimetopause if you're having mood swings and you're moody? If you feel like you've always been that way in the first place, is it just something <laughs> that's, that's more exaggerated perhaps because you're in perimetopause? Yeah, I think that's absolutely a good way of looking at it. The trouble is that it's not really considered best practice to look at uh, blood tests for women uh, over the age of 45, because mm. really the hormones are going to be going up and down like a yo-yo. And depending on the day that you have the blood test, it may or may not show something of interest. It may look completely normal while you're thinking, but I'm going crazy, what's happening? So it is all about pinning down and looking at the symptoms. 
And mm. women who typically have um, a history of anxiety, low mood, or particularly um, issues around PMS related to irritability, um, anger, and so on, tend to find that they are harder hit during the perimenopause. It's often mm. because they're sensitive to fluctuations in progesterone, uh, the, the hormone I mentioned that manages those moods, than other women might be. So something to look out for, yeah. Other than controlling it with proper nutrition, and I also want to talk about vitamins, you know, what kind of vitamins should we be taking? Um, what else can we do in terms of exercise? I mean, it's obvious, right? Go for a walk, all that stuff. But it's building your muscles, right? And again, not to be a bodybuilder, but just to keep those muscles strong enough, right? To just hold us up. Yeah, absolutely. And it's really important to get the balance right, because I think a lot of women in midlife um, move towards the sort of mat-based exercises, the yoga, the Pilates. Now, lots of that is great, but it's very one-dimensional. Um, mm -hmm. So you need to be thinking, okay, well, what about some strength work? What about working with some weights to put pressure and resistance on my bones so that they start to regenerate and renew and remain strong? But also thinking about you know, more active cardiovascular work because the heart is a muscle too. And one of the things that's very um, important for women to understand is that right up to menopause, um, the risk of coronary heart disease for women is much, much lower than men because of the estrogen that protects our muscles. But with the drop in estrogen post-menopause, the risk of, of, of coronary heart disease is, becomes exactly the same as men. So again, oh, really wow. be thinking in the round about the exercise. Hmm. We talked about pro progesterone. What about with the loss of estrogen? Is it sort of the same protocol or is, do we add, do we subtract? What do we do um, with our regimen? Okay, so it still really does all come down to blood sugar. And, th and this is why it's because of our stress hormones. Now, stress really is the enemy of the menopause. And unfortunately in midlife, it tends to be pretty much the most stressful time of a woman's life. There is so much going on out there, you know, puberty in the household, elderly relatives, work pressures, money pressures, emotional pressures, there's just so much going on. So stress hormones are usually going through the roof. Now that's not great because it interferes right. with the body's plan B. Because there was always a plan B, we weren't just abandoned to this estrogen deficiency. Um, as the ovaries stop producing estrogen, the um, adrenal glands are programmed to produce a small amount of estrogen postmenopause to keep us fit and well. So we avoid all these issues we've been talking about. The problem is that they also regulate and produce our stress hormones, cortisol and adrenaline. And so because that's a life-saving response, technically, it's our fight or flight response, the body will always in a primitive way automatically prioritize that. So if you're in a constant state of stress, your adrenal glands will constantly produce stress hormones to the disadvantage of your estrogen because there's gonna be no time for estrogen. And so really looking at, at how to sort that out is important. And from a nutrition perspective, and the reason I bang on about blood sugar all the time is because every time it crashes, your body releases adrenaline, and cortisol to redress the balance. And you don't need extra stress hormones in your life. Mm. You know, it also is important as you're going through that time of life for the people around you to be understanding. You know, it, it's always been the big joke, you know, comedians are like, oh, you know, the little lady at home. And you know, um, <laughs> this is a multifaceted thing, right? You need the whole family sort of involved. If you're going through yeah. something that's a medical condition, yeah. um, telling, telling jokes about it and being insensitive is really not going to help anyone, right? Um, so that's something that I think would be great to clue the men in on, and even people's kids, right? Um, yeah. You don't yeah. make fun of people. You just say, you know, it's it's just like anything else. If you broke a leg, are you going to sort of mock somebody as they're crossing the street? Or are you going to sort of help them across the street? I think that's really important too. It's incredibly important. And I think the problem is that there just isn't enough information out there. I mean, the women nope. themselves don't know about the menopause. No. How can you expect the guys to or the kids to? Um, it's literally, I don't know how it is in the US, but in the UK, literally only just gone on the national curriculum for schools. Um, the really? The menopause has finally gone into schools. 
Um, I'll ask my kids. I don't, I really don't think that they studied that in school. If they did, I'm actually going to ask them today. That's when I didn't think, but we did speak because you and I spoke on the phone uh, earlier about stress and stress levels about uh, us gals in the U S and one thing that's very interesting. And I've always known this, even as a kid, when I would be traveling abroad, you all have way more vacation time than we do. Um, we just don't have that here in America until you like work your way up the ladder, whatever that is, and then you're half dead by the time you get there, right? Yeah. But as a young person in your 30s and 40s and whatever, gosh, you're lucky if you get two weeks of vacation. I mean, who can function on that, right? Talk about stress and then how do you even manage it if you're working yeah. 50 hour, 50 weeks out of the year? Oh my gosh. Um, I know yeah. here in the US, that's something that I think has got to change. Um, so you see people around the world, basically. Yeah, Do you think yeah. that us gals are sort of more stressed out here in the U.S. or is it just a global thing? Oh, I think it varies very much from country to country. You know, there are some countries who've really, really got it sussed. You know, you've got the 35-hour week in France, for example. Um, they know and they, they take proper lunch breaks. We haven't had lunch breaks in the UK for years. I remember oh, really? when I first started working, there would be a morning tea break and an afternoon tea break. And these things disappeared decades ago. And I think it, it always really strikes me when I'm working with women in North America and the US in particular, is the, the limited amount of free time and breaks and downtime you get. When you put that together with... Uh, perhaps raising a growing family, dealing with supporting elderly relatives, there is absolutely no me time. And that's a real problem because one of the things I talk about a lot in my clinic with women, it's not just what to eat, it's okay, well, we can do certain things with food to regulate those stress hormones, like balance your blood sugar. We can look at a few other key nutrients that support the adrenal glands, but also you've kind of got to slow down. And that's incredibly difficult if you're caught in that spiral at work. I promise that's very difficult. Number one, um, half the time, if you don't bring your lunch to work, you can run downstairs and grab, notice I say the word grab something in the lobby and then run up and eat at your desk, right? Uh, myself as a news reporter, there's no such thing as lunch. You're eating in the van and oh. you sort of get used to that kind of life and it's not healthy. And then all of a sudden, yeah, you're in your forties and you're like, whoa, what just happened here? And um, you're stressed. And at least for me, um, I would look down and go, oh, I got a little extra in the middle there. And I, I guess that's the cortisol, right? And lack of yeah. a proper exercise. Dear Lord, what do we do about that whole cortisol issue that's creeping up? Yeah, no, it is a real problem because, you know, when you get that little band of fat around the middle, and we, we all know the one I mean, we, you know, most of us have got it. Yeah. It's what I call this little band of responsibility because it tends to come <laughs> to women in their sort of 40s um, when there's just a lot going on and part of the problem is it's the body's plan c because if the adrenal glands haven't got space to produce the estrogen postmenopause, then they'll fall back on plan c which is to store fat because fat around the middle has its own hormone profile and then the hormones can go there instead so again it really comes down to balancing that blood sugar so that you're keeping it nice and steady you're not driving extra cortisol, extra adrenaline, both of which will interfere with the, the production both of estrogen and actually progesterone because high levels of adrenaline interfere with the action of progesterone in the second half of the cycle. So women who are prone to um, very much the sort of mood swings and irritability um, before their period are really the ones who need to be super focusing on, on blood sugar balance. For me, it's been anxiety, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I noticed it, you know, although I noticed it after the fact, but it's, it's anxiety, right? Um, yeah. can that go away <laughs> the overproduction of cortisol or is it just very happy where it's, where it's sitting? Um, let's just say we didn't manage it right. Right. Is it just going to be there? Is there a way to control it and, you know, get yeah, it out of there? <laughs> There's always a way, but I think you have to be very aware of your own body. And I think yeah. one of the things I see a lot is that women aren't admitting their stress. You know, they either say, oh, but I thrive on it. I love it. Um, or, you know, this is all great. I'm fine. And I look at them and I think, my goodness me, you're twitchy. You've no idea how genuinely stressed you are. So the first thing is to actually recognize that that's an issue. Because until you do that, there's nothing to be done. 
Um, yeah. And, and then it really is starting to think of a few things. And one of the things I really say to women quite firmly is, this is your time. You've got to start putting yourself first. We're really bad at that. You know, everybody, particularly the kids, go ahead of us. Uh, the, the partner, the work, the friends, the parents. It's everybody else before us. And actually, this is the time in your life above all else where you need to put yourself first. And even if you only do it because everything else will fall apart uh, if you don't, then that, at least that's a reason to do it. Because for the most part, women are the heart of their community, of their household. And if you crash, then everything's going to fall apart. No, it's true, which is why I think it's which is why I think it's also a family approach. You know, everyone sort of needs to be involved. Mom needs yeah. some time, right? And very yeah. often, at least here, we still feel guilty taking some private time for ourselves, sort of like we ought to be filling it with something else. Go do the, you know, like you could do the dishes or you could go do something for your kids, like you said, or your husband, or your parents, or whatever. We're filling yeah. it with other stuff. And that's number one, I think. It's like, look, you got to take a little time for yourself. For me, it's about going for a walk. I'm fortunate to live near the beach. So I try and go look, walk somewhere near the water. And that always just brings me right back yeah. to where I should be, back to center. So I always say, wherever you live, whatever it is, gosh, I mean, what do you suggest? 15 minutes a day, 10 minutes, just something to center yeah. you? Or Absolutely. I mean, ideally, if you could take an hour a day at weekends, um, for a start, just that's for you. And don't yeah. put yourself, don't suddenly say, oh, we'll go for a nice family walk because it'll be good for everyone. No, this is not about the family. This is about you. you know, maybe this is your walk on your own. Maybe this is you doing some arts and crafts if you like that, or playing a musical instrument, or, or just lying on your bed reading a magazine. It doesn't have to be anything massively productive, but something that just gives a bit of you time and really calms uh -huh. things down. And if remotely possible, oh, something for your head, because as you said, you know, we get a little bit of fog and memory loss. So I'm um, honestly just a week ago, I started taking up another language. So now I have a class. So even Brilliant. taking up a class, right? And it doesn't matter what it is. It certainly doesn't have to be a language, but just something, right? Yeah. And that's, that's, that's my me time. Me. That's yeah. my me time. And I kind of enjoy the whole Zoom thing because then I don't have to Zoom somewhere in my car. I could just sort of do it like this, the way I'm talking to you, and I feel perfectly satisfied, quite frankly. Fantastic. I mean, what I would say is um, a big shout out for magnesium as a huge help when it comes to anxiety and stress and all of these things. Hmm. Magnesium. Okay. In a pill, in our food, or all the above? Always start with the food. Always hmm. start with the food right. because that's the most recognizable form for the body, and it means that you're going to be benefiting from lots of other things because foods that contain magnesium will also contain calcium for example um, which of course we know we need for strong bones so right. the great thing about magnesium is that it's a proper multitasker you know if it were a person it would be a very busy midlife woman because it's literally <laughs> got hundreds of jobs to do um, one of those is regulating the body's response to stress calming the nervous system so if you've got enough magnesium all that stress will still be there, but you'll feel like there's a buffer um, and you're protected from it. And you think, oh, this is a bit stressful, but I'm OK, as opposed to, ah, what do I do? Yeah. Um, uh, where can you get the most magnesium for the buck, if you will, if you say food <laughs> is the best? What's okay. the best foods to eat for that? Leafy green vegetables. So spinach, uh, arugula, kale, um, what else? Uh, cabbage, broccoli. They're all fantastic sources of um, magnesium. So a couple of handfuls of leafy greens every day is a really mm -hmm. good shout. Whole grains and, like brown rice. Brown, okay. Um, you also said uh, flaxseed, right? Try and get yourself some flaxseed in your diet, correct? Yeah, absolutely. Now, flaxseed's got a quadruple whammy of brilliance about it. Oh. Um, <laughs> it's just really the top food for a woman in midlife because it's packed with protein. Um, it's also packed with fiber, complex carbohydrate. So you've got that blood sugar balancing combo straight away. So a big spoon of, of flaxseed or ground flaxseed, I would say, on cereal in a smoothie in the morning. It's a great way to get that balanced start of the day. On top of that, it's packed with omega-3. Now we need omega-3 to calm our nervous system, for our brain health, for our heart health, 
also skin and hair, the most important things, of course. Um, and the, the added bonus is that it's a really great source of lignans. Now, lignans are compounds called phytoestrogens that actually influence our estrogen receptors and mimic the action of estrogen in the body. So there's some interesting research that suggests that having some flaxseed in your diet every day can reduce a lot of the issues around uh, menopause symptoms, in particular hot flushes. Mm. In particular, the hot flashes, yeah. Um, let's talk about once you sort of round the curve, if you will, and you've gotten yourself through that menopause period, particularly that one day, right, where you haven't, I guess, gotten your period for a year, um, and a couple of years beyond that. What should you be doing, right? I know bone strength is everything, but sort of to help with your memory, uh, to help with the bone strength and just, you know, to have a vital life as you progress on, because you're right. It's sort of the second half of our, of our lives. We're living longer. We want yeah. to live healthy. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the thing is that most of the sort of big common symptoms, like the anxiety, the mood swings, the hot flashes and so on, they tend to settle down after a while as your your body adjusts to the new hormonal version of you, a bit like, you know, it's dreadful during puberty and then suddenly I've seen you rediscover that fabulous um, child um, who had become a monster for a few years. So that's fine, but there are a few things you've got to think about all the time. I mentioned the cardiovascular health earlier. We mm. talked about bones, but the big one that often gets ignored, I sometimes think of it as the Cinderella of the menopause, is vaginal health, intimate health. because these are issues that will continue beyond. They're not just going to settle down a year or two after the big day. And Wait, the problem is there. what vaginal health? Like what, what in particular? Are you talking dryness or no dryness? Because um, okay. a lot of, yeah, go ahead. I'm talking dryness. I'm talking itching, discomfort, painful sex. Um, with the drop in estrogen, it affects the acidity levels of the vagina, which will make you more prone to urinary infections, uh, mm. which can be very common for women, particularly in later life. You know, lots of elderly women end up with urinary tract infections that are often untreated, which can cause you know, a lot of confusion um, and um, uh, memory issues for them. And then, of course, yeah, they'll get up in the middle of the night, they'll have a fall, and then it all becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So really be thinking about what's going on there. Thrush, again, is a really common one. And you might be sort of having lots of antifungals, lots of antibiotics. But could it be actually that the underlying cause is all about the, the drop in estrogen in the vagina? And then you've got to think about your pelvic floor, get that muscle tone. Remember I talked about the drop in muscle tone? Because if the pelvic floor becomes weak, you'll become more prone to leaking, otherwise known as urinary stress incontinence. So when you leak a little bit of urine, when you're running or uh, you laugh or you sneeze. So these are things that are very easily dealt with. Um, if you know how to do it and what to do. Um, but they're equally things that women don't like to talk about so much. We've become more confident talking about hot flashes. Not many women would like to admit the fact that they leak a bit of urine, when in fact one in three women worldwide, it will happen to them. One in three. Okay. Um, I don't leak, but boy, do I have to go like often. And I actually went to a doctor finally, like a week or two ago for it myself. And she's like, you're fine. I'm thinking I'm fine. I have to always go to the bathroom at sometimes the most unopportune times ever. Um, what do you do for that? I guess exercises, right? Because I do them, but uh, I'm yeah. sure I'm not alone. I'm sure people are listening and they're like, oh yeah, me too. Okay. So you need to be seeing a women's health physiotherapist. That's so basically a physiotherapist that specializes in pelvic health because that's a different discipline from the musculoskeletal uh, ones that most of us are more familiar with. Um, because if you're, it's, it's very easy to read up on um, pelvic floor exercises, but if you're not doing them right, <laughs> then it's going to be a complete waste of time. And again, one of the things that's very common that women don't think about is it's not just about tightening up those muscles all the time. Some women who are very stressed um, overdo it. And then the muscles become uh, affected in a different way because you, you're too stressed and they're tightening up. So it's still not working properly. So sometimes, you know, you, could, you can have too much of a good thing. And this is where, you know, a specialist pelvic health physio could really help you. Hmm. What else would you like to add for our audience? Because, I mean, we, we really barely touched, but we actually gave sort of 
um, the outline of what you talk about a lot in your book. You also mentioned vitamin E. I did want to mention that because I'm not E, vitamin K in particular. Um, I'm reading a lot about vitamin K. You have uh, information here in your book about vitamin K. Is that real important for us as well as we go through this time? Well, the big thing about vitamin K is that it, it, it plays a key role in bone health. So it helps mm. the body produce um, a protein called osteocalcin, which right. makes our bones harder. And it works in synergy. That's the thing. No point in just stuffing yourself with calcium for strong bones because without vitamin D, your body won't absorb it. You'll just end up with calcium deposits in places you don't want them, like kidney stones and so on. It can be very uncomfortable. But you know the, the compound of, of uh, nutrients that work for bones are magnesium, calcium, vitamin C, vitamin D, vitamin K. So it's having the, the group of those. And one of the fabulous things about leafy green vegetables, again, is that they've got calcium, um, vitamin C, magnesium, and vitamin K all in one package. So uh, not just helping in terms of issues around anxiety, they're a very bone-friendly food as well, which is great. I did want to touch upon uh, digestive issues since you talked kidney stones. Um, mm. A lot of people I know are suddenly, they're not even drinkers. They have issues with their liver and they have gallstones. Um, what is, what is that about? I mean, because you're right. Cause then you can have issues with your kidney and all that. Is it, is that about the processing? Is that about what's going on with our bodies through menopause, all the above? Well, I mean, the thing is when you've got issues around that, it's probably related to the liver's ability to produce bile, uh, mm. which is the compound that breaks down the fat, um, and therefore make sure that you don't end up with issues around, around the gallbladder. Um, one of the problems we've got as we sort of move through midlife is that there's a lot going on and our liver's very busy. The liver is not just a detox organ, it does other stuff. As I've mentioned, it produces bile. It also regulates um, and processes old hormones, getting rid of them so that you've got the correct balance in the body. It stores mm. vitamin D, e, vitamin A, vitamin K. And if you're keeping it constantly busy with um, toxins like alcohol and caffeine and maybe medication, nicotine, all of these things are going to distract it from the other jobs it can do. So eventually that will impact in a roundabout way on issues around your digestion, for example, and lots of other issues too. So really making sure that you're getting that balance right is incredibly important. Yeah, I know. And bloat. Okay. I mean, let's face it, the good old bloat. Um, I try very hard to drink as much water. I love warm water and I put fresh lemon in it. That actually fills me up if I have warm water with lemon. I didn't think it would until a friend of mine said, gosh, would you just try it? And I find <laughs> I crave more of it. And I'm thinking, gosh, I'm doing a good thing for my body because I'm cleansing it. Um, and I'm, I'm keeping it uh, as pure as I can, right? Because we do need enough water to filter Great. through our bodies as well yeah absolutely yeah we've got to hydrate properly but also i mean we need to think about what how much alcohol we're having how much caffeine we're having because mm. both of those um directly impact your menopause symptoms i mean alcohol is an absolute killer when it comes to hot flushes caffeine plays havoc with your sleep and it's important to remember that you're in a phase of transition so even if you could drink coffee all day long when you were younger doesn't mean you can do it now. The enzymes yeah. in your house may not be so effective. So start to audit that. You know, do you need to stop earlier in the day to help your sleep? Don't just assume that what used to work will still work. Jackie, how can people find your podcast? Because it's a terrific podcast. It's filled with great info. Uh, could you tell our audience? And then I also want to tell them where to pick up this book as well. It's terrific. Sure. Well, it's in all the usual places. The Happy Menopause, it's on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Podcasts. Um, Google Podcasts, um, Spotify. If it's if it's easier, follow me on social media. I am at Well 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 UK, um, so very easy to find. And uh, my lovely book is also available um, in all good bookstores, all the usual places. Um, you'll be able to find it there. Yeah. Anything? Any parting words you'd like to tell our audience? But again, we only just touched the surface. I would like people. Uh, to pick this up. Again, I want to remind you, it's a super easy read. I like to thumb through books like this, especially if there's something I need to read about immediately. And it's easy to do. You always give lifestyle picks, uh, tips rather. You talk about low libido. You talk about everything in here. If you've got a question for what's going on with you uh, emotionally, um, within your body, it's in here. 
Um, but are there any parting words you'd like to tell our audience? Yeah, I think I'd say be kind to yourself. This is the time mm. really for you to be looking after yourself. That includes nutrition, that includes lifestyle. Start to put yourself first, because if you do that, everything else will start to fall into place. Yeah. And listen to your podcast. I found it very calming. So I really enjoyed listening <laughs> uh, to the Happy Menopause podcast. So everybody, why don't you join me and listen, join me and pick up this book, The Happy Menopause. And I'm sure if you reach out to Jackie Lynch on her social media, which is wellwellwell.uk, I'm sure she'll answer. So um, Jackie, I really enjoyed talking to you very, very much. So uh, I appreciate you taking the time, calling us over from the UK. I know you're many hours ahead of us. So it's getting late there. Um, and I hope to have you back. Very interesting conversation. Thanks very much for having me. I'd love to come back. Yeah. And uh, thanks everybody for joining us on Deborah Covelt Live. Same thing. You can find our podcast everywhere, IGTV, YouTube, Facebook, and on all the audio platforms as well. Apple, Spotify, blah, blah, blah. Just type us in there. You'll find us as well as Jackie Lynch's podcast, The Happy Menopause. And um, we'll see you next time. Be good to yourself. Bye-bye.